due process for the second consecutive year, recipient of Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards for Outstanding Talk Show Series and Outstanding Public Affairs Series. Art imitates real life, a workshop for urban kids in self-defense from those sworn to protect them. Police brutality, a cancer on the force, or overblown issue. Next, on the docket for this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, Publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual. Is police brutality a constant threat or a rare occurrence? Are minorities more likely to unfairly experience police force or just faster to complain about police conduct? I'm Raymond Brown. A problem as old as law enforcement itself remains controversial and is on our docket for today. How often do police use too much force? Studies by government commissions in California and human rights groups in New York have said it happens too often, especially to minorities. Law enforcement officials concede that it happens, but say that it is not an everyday occurrence. Like the rest of the nation, New Jersey has had its share of police brutality debates, and the discussion continues. For much of America, they are friends in blue, charged with a sacred trust to protect and serve. Without them, society would soon fall into chaos. They are the ones to call when trouble calls. Society's guardsmen, little appreciated and seldom thanked. But this videotape of the vicious beating of Rodney King in 1991 shattered that image as nothing else could. For the first time, we saw that our collective faith might be misplaced. Unfortunately, this was not a revelation to the minority community. Stop! It's a workshop in Essex County, New Jersey, designed to prevent real-life tragedy. Its principal audience is at-risk youth. The aim is to teach these young people how not to wind up victims of police violence. How real did that look to you? How many of you have seen that, heard that scenario, seen that story somewhere before in your community? Raise the your workshop hand. leader is Officer DeLacy Davis, founder of Black Cops Against Police Brutality, BCAP. It's a grassroots organization that I founded between police officers and community in which our goal is to protect and serve our community. His workshop is called What to Do When Stopped by the Police. One of the things we need to talk about and understand is don't run from the police. Isn't that what we talked about? The lessons are simple, straightforward, and designed to save lives. They are grouped under three headings. One, the stop on the street the traffic stop in the motor vehicle and when the police come knocking at your door. We hope to arm you with material and information so that you don't become a victim. So that These are lessons unknown in middle-class suburbia, but they are a necessary part of urban survival. But his efforts have not met with universal acceptance, particularly within his own police ranks. Inside of law enforcement, we're hated by many because we're not going along to get along. I just want to abolish the corruption, the abuse, the mistreatment, and the degradation that particularly people of color have suffered at the hands of, of the police of all colors. The problem goes back to accountability. Traditionally, there has been little recourse for victims of police abuse. Courts rarely side with plaintiffs who bring charges against cops, and the ranks are particularly good at protecting their own. The code of silence functions in a variety of ways, but what's significant that I've heard in the academy is that you're told you're not black, you're not white, you're not Latino, you're blue. Our people must take chances, must take risks as a result of their job. And that wears on somebody. It's like fine sandpaper, and it keeps wearing on them. 
Significantly, not one police officer testified in a case of police brutality that rocked Jersey City for three years. Thomas Camerata, the defense attorney, outlines the story. The disturbance evidently started when two individuals uh, who had been uh, drinking in a tavern across the street got out of the bar, went into the convenience store to get cigarettes, saw the uh, fellow Julio Tarquino, who ultimately died from this incident. It was 3 a.m. The two white men made racial slurs. The off-duty cop on the scene asked everyone to go home. Outside, Tarquino, his fiance Jenny Fiaios, and friend George Canis continued to have words with the two men. At that moment, off-duty Jersey City police officer John Chisulo pulled into the gas station and intervened to break up the dispute. John Chisulo has this confrontation with uh, the young lady and with Mr. Tarquino, and ultimately is able to handcuff uh, the two of them, although there's a discrepancy in the facts. Julio Tarquino was hit on the head by Officer Chisulo after he was handcuffed. The blow to his head caused an epidural hematoma, bleeding into his skull. Five days later, he was dead. The ultimate verdict was they, they were hung on the manslaughter charge. They convicted John Chisulo of a lesser charge, aggravated assault, official misconduct, and possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. No weapon was ever found. There are very significant appeal issues. Tom Camerata hopes he will be able to obtain bail pending appeal. Meanwhile, the civil case on behalf of the Tarquino family is being handled by Shelley Stangler of Jacoby and Myers. The case is against John Chizullo, but it is also against the city of Jersey City. There's also a medical malpractice component to the case because Mr. Tarquino was taken to the hospital where we do not believe he was properly treated or diagnosed. Yes, officer. Can I have your license, registration, and insurance card, please? The sad fact of this case is that if Julio Tarquino had taken to Lacey Davis' workshop, he might have just walked away. On the other hand, some observers, like Thomas Camerata, believe the police are being unfairly criticized. I think when a police officer is confronted with a situation like this in the future, I really think he's going to hesitate to act for fear that he's going to be the next John Chisulo. The relationship between police and civilians, especially minorities, is complex. However, progress towards resolving the question of police brutality must include breaking the code of silence. There needs to be a vehicle that is accessible for good police officers who want to give up the bad ones. There is none. There is no reward. There is no attaboy for an officer of any race who wants to say, hey, listen, by the way, my partner knocked four teeth out of this kid's mouth tonight, and I don't want to confront my partner, but I want to give him up. Rather than the system going after the officer who committed the offense, the system will go after the officer who ratted him out. When we come back, we'll call on Johnny Cochran and other seasoned voices in the police brutality debate to shed some new light on a continuing controversy. Using excessive force frequently, I think, is not a fair statement to police, being that my son and many of my family members are policemen. I think it has to do with the individuals and their beliefs. I think the systems should be more careful about avoiding burnout for policemen and giving more counseling. It's a day in and day out for the policemen, you know, so they make wrong decisions and they make right decisions, and hopefully they make more right than they make wrong. Sometimes it's not necessary to throw people on the ground. And to arrest them and bend their arm behind their back. You know, if you just tell them, lean against the car or whatever, they'll do it. Is unjustified police violence a serious problem or a red herring distracting us from more serious justice issues? Are some citizens more likely to complain about it or experience it? In discussing the subject, do we ignore real problems faced by police on the job? For some answers to these questions, we turn to Johnny Cochran, a criminal defense lawyer whose former clients include O.J. Simpson and folks who've sued police departments around the country, and Richard Whalen, president of the New Jersey Fraternal Order of Police, 
a member of Governor Whitman's Commission on the Implementation of the Death Penalty, and a well-known spokesman for law enforcement. And joining us from Newark are Lawrence Hamm, a well-known community activist, chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, and a recent recipient of a humanitarian award from Black Cops Against Police Brutality. And last, but certainly not least, Anthony Fusco, who's been a practicing lawyer in New Jersey for more than 25 years. He's counsel to the New Jersey FOP and frequently represents and teaches police officers. Welcome to you all. And since the other three gentlemen are old friends of mine, Rick, and I've just met you today, let me start with you and ask you a question based on the report we just saw, the Lacey Davis trying to teach kids to deal with cops. I would suspect that if I talk to the most of the black parents that I know, they would say that's necessary because black kids are almost always in some position of potential jeopardy because they may have to interact with police and be the subject of violence. That's the perception that's widespread. Is that a fair perception? Is it an accurate perception of dangers that confront black children, especially in terms of dealing with police? I think if you've really looked at all the cases that, that are reported and are investigated and, and however far they get, I think each individual case has to be judged on its own merits. Whether they're uh, picking on, on the black children, uh, you're always, I think you're always going to find a uh, majority of the time that something led up to that. Uh, but these cases of the, the, the police brutality, I, you know, I, I just want to say that I think that you're really uh, doing harm to the, to the system. Uh, to the citizens and to the police by sensationalizing every case that comes up there. Uh, I'm not an advocate or a proponent, and uh, I would never uh, lie for a fellow officer uh, in, in that kind of a case. But when the defense attorneys like Johnny or anybody else that would represent uh, the alleged victims, uh, when they take these and they have days and months and weeks to analyze something that that officer had a few seconds to decide. Uh, and they take this and the media uh, blows it out of proportion. And using the case in, uh, in Newark a year and a half ago, the officer, uh, narcotics Let me just stop officer. you for one second before we get to a specific case and ask Johnny, Rick says there aren't patterns, that each case is individual, yet there obviously are folks who believe that there's a pattern in terms of circumstances where it's most likely to have police brutality. Do you think there are patterns? Or well, I think there are definitely patterns. I'd like to hope they weren't. But, and I bring this from a perspective of having been the assistant district attorney of L.A. County who looked at, and we had, I had the SID division, we looked at government corruption, including police shootings and that sort of thing. So I've looked at it from both sides. And I gotta tell you, there are patterns. If you take the, the stops on the New Jersey Turnpike, if you take the stops uh, in Maryland, if you take the stops in, in Florida, blacks are disproportionately, I mean high numbers, 70, 80 percent of those who were stopped. There is racial profiling, and that's wrong. Now, he's right, I think that some cases get blown out of proportion, but I think the cases that, that the, the media attaches onto are endemic of problems. If you take the new case out in California, in Riverside, California, a young black girl, 17, 18, 19 years of age, in a car, she's in distress. Police are called to help. They shoot 27 times into that car. A young black girl, that wouldn't have happened if she was a white girl. Believe me, and you take Abner Louima, and this problem of this conspiracy of silence, if you want to see the endemic problem, take Abner Louima. The first officer who comes forward to make a statement, Turetsky, comes forward five days later. You know, who, you know where he is now? He's in police protection against the other police. What does that say about this whole industry? This is an endemic societal problem, and we never get away from it from trying to hide from it. Let me bring Tony Fusco into the conversation. Tony, on the one hand, we have a suggestion, uh, a statement that this is really media hype, that it's individual cases and no patterns. On the other hand, a pretty clear statement that we can look to see patterns both of a code of silence and of police violence directed disproportionately at some members of the community. What's your response? Let, let me tell you about the, um, uh, Johnny's allegation about the, uh, the stops. First of all, if, the, uh, if that's an illegal situation with regard to the stops and their profiles, that's not police brutality. So let's dismiss that, number one. Number two, I don't like the statements of police brutality. There is no such thing as police brutality in the sense that every police officer is a brutal individual. There's individual acts, there's individual specific cases that we say that you can point to police officers going over the line and doing something illegal. Of course that happens. That happens in every walk of life in this entire country. So let's be real and let, let's get down to it. What happens in this country is that the police in general are being, uh, in essence, lumped up into this one group and we're saying that every time a police officer acts, he acts or she acts incorrectly. And to make a statement that, uh, well, it wouldn't happen to a white, a white person, I, I don't believe that in every particular case. There well, may be the individuals. If you look at the facts, if you look at the facts, and the whole problem is this. This is a system where the good cops fear the bad cops. That's oh, the that's problem. 
the good, the good cops, Johnny, let me tell you something. The good why? cops, Rick, That's if the true. good cops would come forward, they'd the stop the cops. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. These, these police departments are paramilitary organizations. If you told a police officer to run through that wall, they'd do it. But if you tell them, look, stop shooting people or stop being so trigger happy or whatever, or treat people with more respect, there's a big problem. With the That's LAPD, not... let me tell you something. You'd have a, they're, they're much tougher <coughs> on char charging someone with conduct on becoming an officer, going out and picking up somebody after work, than they are with shooting some citizen. The, their priorities are, are somewhat confused, it seems to me. Johnny, That's Johnny, Johnny let me interrupt you. The, 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 the statistics too. of police officers <coughs> shooting people, no, I don't care what, poli what color everybody is, the, the statistics of police officer shooting has gone down tremendously in the last 10 or 15 years. You know why? Because so, of lawsuits right, let me, and because let me, of pressure. Right, right, let me bring why? my friend Lawrence Hammond. Lawrence, you're sitting next to my other friend, Tony Fusco, who says there's no such thing as police brutality. What's your response to that? Well, Tony is absolutely wrong. Uh, police brutality is a documented problem uh, in our country. Um, you made reference to it earlier, Ray, about various reports, the most recent of, of which is the Amnesty International report on human rights abuses in the United States. And they looked at every major city in the United States, and they have documented uh, thousands of police brutality cases, and they have identified it as a problem that is systemic and nationwide. This is a national problem. Uh, po incidents of police brutality occur every day. They may not occur in the same community every day, but they occur every day. And um, when people talk about cases that are sensationalized, it is only the most egregious cases that we hear about, like the Abner Louima case, which really wasn't an issue of police brutality, it was an issue of police torture. But thousands of incidents where uh, citizens are unjustly brutalized uh, by police occur every day. Now, I say that not to say that most police aren't hardworking. They do a dangerous job. They put themselves on the line every day. But in every pro profession, we have people that commit wrongs. If a teacher is guilty of some type of sex offense, that doesn't make all teachers sex offenders. This problem of police brutality is real. There are many uh, police, the majority, not the majority, but there are many individuals who have serious problems, who have racist attitudes. Lawrence, you, you raised the point that I want to I mm -hmm. direct at Rick. It seems to me that underlying this discussion at this point is the question of whether, since I assume everybody would concede there are sometimes excessive use of force, Absolutely. is whether police organizations effectively police their own personnel or whether it's allowed to get out of hand so there is an effective restraint. Uh, that's, I think, what's implied in what Lawrence said and what Johnny said. What's your feeling about effective policing? I can tell you from my personal experience and, and my friends and colleagues, uh, no individual is going to jeopardize uh, his career, his pension, his family, uh, his home uh, for, for another officer. It's just not going to happen. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but it's just not going to happen in every day like it's being referred to. These incidents, like I said, they do happen by blowing them out like, like I referred to. What you're doing, you're, you're putting fear into the citizens out there. Uh, you're making other officers apprehensive when they do approach an, in, an individual. Uh, we weren't there on every one of these cases. We don't know what precipitated this initial act to, to cause this violence. Okay. So, I mean, let we me need ask, to let these right, investigations let me take a, their course. Let me pose a, me pose a question to Rick and Tony, which is this. There have been studies like the uh, Christopher Commission in California, uh, the Mollen Commission in New York, and Amnesty International, which have said that these are patterns that are pervasive and not just in one town or with one cop. They've suggested it's more. There are obviously other law enforcement people who say, no, it isn't. Why do we have this strange disconnect on the basic question of whether this is isolated instance blown up or whether there's a pattern? Well, any study you ask, it depends on what the questions that are asked and who you're asking the questions to. I mean, if you turn around and you take the statistics from any, just like uh, the governor recently said that the crime's down, that's statistics, the crime is down. If you're going to go around and just count numbers, but to say this is an overwhelming uh, problem, and like Tony referred to, uh, police brutality, uh, there are incidents. There are incidents where officers are wrong. The incident you referred to in New York, those officers were prosecuted, and they were They're removed from the job. That's all I'm saying to do. Do it, report it in the media after it's done. Don't stand up on a, on, on a soapbox and say, uh, you know, police brutality, we're going to do an investigation, we're going to demand this, and we're going to demand that. You're, you're really throwing fear into Johnny, the public are, and fear into the other officers. Right. That's all I'm saying. Give us due process, just like uh, the, the clients you represent. Absolutely entitled due process. In fact, in New York City, please get more due process than anyone else. You can't even talk to them for 48 hours, which is an outrageous rule. But let me tell you something, Rick. I, I endorse 
address what you say about the large number of men and women who are in blue around this country trying to do their jobs. The problem is, it's the supervision, it's the accountability of the top. They don't have, feel any responsibility. If, if, they, if, the, if they were properly investigated, if some of these complaints were taken seriously, it would change some of this. And you talk about citizens being afraid. What you mistake is the number of citizens of color in this country who actually fear the police. Uh, they fear them as a gang in blue, and that's a real problem. And you haven't come to grips with that. You're talking about worrying about, the, and what, what I'm just trying to say is you've got to address all citizens. And when people are, are meted out, if people of color are treated differently, are perceived they're treated differently, it makes a big difference. And that can be changed, it seems to me, by some leadership. The, the police departments always want to wipe away all the reports. Whether you talk about the Kerner Commission report, the Knapp, the Mullen, Webster, Christopher, and now Amnesty. They pretend like these, these reports don't mean anything. These reports exist and they are real and they talk about an endemic, systemic problem that can be addressed, it seems to me, but it's not addressed by burying your head in the sand. What difference does it make if you call it police brutality or police excessive force? We're talking about where a police officer violates the constitutional rights of a citizen and it shouldn't happen, well, especially you're trying, you're where it's based upon the, the person's color. Tony, go ahead. You're only talking about the sensational case. And that's the that's the No, I'm talking about the every Tony, I'm talking no. about the everyday case. No, the every baloney. night no, case you're not. where somebody's pulled baloney. over you're, you're because of their about, race or their look, creed or their gender, because look, of their economic status. That's what I'm look, talking you're about. You're not you're, look, you're no, talking this, about this the sensational happen. case. You're talking about the Louima case. You're talking about the case uh, out in, in the videotape that you showed before. Sure, these people are not right. They're guilty. No, no, no kidding. But you can't say that cops just because they pull somebody over, one cop is white the, and the, the person is black in the car, that everybody yells race all the time. Why don't you look at the results Tony, of the why, case? Let me ask you this, Tony. Why is there such a widespread perception among black folks that blacks are disproportionately the victims? You know, Ray, I don't think I don't think it's are. that bad because today as it was 10 years well, ago. Let's ask Lawrence, I think it's better, to, much better today. And anybody doubts that cops aren't investigated? Let them come to the Newark Police Department and see how their internal affairs aggressively investigates, goes after the cops when it's the, in almost every case. Lawrence, and you do have cops testifying against cops. Lawrence, you want yes. to get in? Yes, I just wanted to add uh, regarding, again, this issue of uh, sensationalism. We have to look at the facts. We can't just go on our emotions. A recent report was issued called Stolen Lives. And just since 1995, there have been more than 1,000 killings as a result of police uh, action or police brutality, if you want to call it. Again, only certain cases uh, reach the media and are quote unquote sensationalized. This is a serious problem. And when we look at the numbers of incidents of police brutality, it's absolutely true. African, Lawrence, can I interrupt African, you to ask you about something yes. that I've heard you distress before, which is in terms of solutions, you've talked about civilian complaint review, review boards and special prosecutors. Are those issues that you think need to be discussed in terms of possible solutions to this? Absolutely. I think it is time, uh, as we have in New York, every major city, every town that has a uh, significant sized police force needs a, an independent civilian complaint review board. There must be oversight of police forces at the state, the county, and the local levels. Because in, in one sense, what we have going on now is the criminal justice system investigating itself. Lawrence, but, since we're running out of time, let me put what you say to Rick. It, assume that there are a large number of citizens, or some who have the perception that there is a problem. Do you think there's a, ne a need for greater oversight, Rick, or do you think it's adequate? Not in the form of a civilian review board. I think everything that's in place is, is adequate. Uh, what you're saying is that you don't trust the, the prosecutors that are appointed in the county or the attorney generals in the state if a case is, is given to him. That's what you're saying. To put un qualified civilians uh, to make decisions on an individual's career and livelihood that's just not fair when no other VA, no other individual no other uh, professionals are, are put in that position and police should be raised exception. an interesting issue when you were a DA could you be trusted to prosecute no, a no, we prosecute we, we, we would look for all kind of ways to to uh, not prosecute a police officer even in some bad shootings they, we prosecuted such a, a minuscule amount and they are tough cases to win because these are the same people, the police officers, who bring the cases to the DA every day. Well, the DAs in the L.A. County DA's office were isolated. Because they were isolated from other deputies who wanted, how could you possibly do this job? It, it, it's an impossible what about task. That's not, I think Tony will, uh, Tony will uh, back me up that I don't think this is happening in New Tony, Jersey. Tony, we're down to the wire in you terms of time. What about the relationship Johnny talks about, that Ray. cops work regularly with prosecutors and DAs? 
Look at all the amount of indictments that you had just from Essex County over the last 10 years with police officers. Yeah, look at all the heard. look at all of the indictments that came out of the U.S. Attorney's Office that are still doing it. They're all there. And as far as the allegation of we need a um, a civilian review board, you have it already. It's called the grand jury. Only in New Jer I believe only in New Jersey. Every time a police officer shoots his gun, well, either Tony, misses or I hits somebody, stop you. it goes I'm to the grand shocked, jury. But it looks as though we're not going to resolve this issue today. Uh, that's all we have time for. Hopefully, we can revisit it. But we want to thank you for being with us on this edition of Due Process. Join us next week when our docket will include another important look at law and social justice. Till then, for all of us here at Due Process, I'm thanking all my guests and thanking you. Make sure you have your registrations, your license, and your um, insurance card. Perfect. What do you do if the windows are smoked out on the car? What are you supposed to do, my brother? Loud. Roll them down if you have power. Roll them down. What do you do with the lights in the car if it's nighttime? Somebody in the back, raise your hand. Show me if you know. Raise your hand. My brother, the glasses here. Turn the interior light on. Why do you turn the interior light on? So they can see what's inside the car. So they can see what's inside. And why would the officer need to see what's inside? Somebody, I know you know. Come on, Kurt, you just been through it. What's what? Raise your hand. What's up, Kurt? So they won't see you. So they can see what, what's going on inside the car. That's coast. exactly right. So there's no fear. So it also sees what's going on inside of the car. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.